Hi there. If you make music on iPad with Beatmaker 3, you might want to grab yourself a coffee and stick around. We're going to cover a whole lot of topics in the next 20 or so minutes. First thing we'll need is a powered USB hub, and we're going to plug this in. Power to the hub. Check. We're going to use the Focusrite Scarlett audio interface today, and we'll go ahead and just plug that right into our powered USB port. Now, plug the powered USB hub into the Apple camera connection kit. Okay, we'll go ahead and plug this into our iPad Mini 2, and we'll wait for a light to come on on the front of the focus right here. It shows that it's connected. We're going to open BeatMaker 3. We're going to start a new session, and we will go to the mixer, click on the ins and outs, and you'll see that we have our Scarlet assigned and connected. And I find this pretty useful as well. This USB hub from Anchor has three USBs on the bottom that are just power. So we're going to plug this into one of those three that's just power. And we'll plug this right in to the camera connecting kit. And you'll see here that we're getting power to the iPad now. Fantastic. And for the microphone, I've chosen this Nady CM88 condenser microphone. It's nothing special. It's not an expensive mic. It's probably a $50 mic, but it's certainly going to give us a better recording than the built-in iPad Mini 2 mic. I've connected the mic to the Focusrite interface now, and I've turned on the phantom power. The switch on the front is set to instrument, and the input level is turned all the way down. I've got BeatMaker 3 open. And let's do some recording. Let's set up here. We're going to record onto the first pad. And let's go into the sampler page. Press record. And here we have the audio recorder window. We're just going to press the recording source. Hardware input. And because the microphone is a mono signal, all we need to do is select Scarlet 2i2 USB 1. And that just gives us the first input only and not both inputs. And we're going to be recording a mono signal. All right, let's see what kind of stuff we've got here. Some box of nuts and bolts and stuff, some plastic and headphone packaging, microphone clips, some guitar capos, plastic rubber goodies, cables, guitar tuner. Oh, this is too easy. Are you kidding me? Uh, all right, we've got all sorts of stuff to work with here. Let's do this. Okay, let's start off with this little silica gel packet. We can get some shaker sounds and maybe some crunchy stuff to add with the snare. Let's we'll press start. All right, let's take a look at that. Cool. We've got all sorts of stuff to trim out there. I'm going to switch over to pad two now. And I've got some plastic bags with some headphones in them. I'm going to press start. Cool. All right. Let's move on over to pad three. We'll hit the record. We'll hit start. Fantastic.
All right, we've done quite a bit now, so let's not forget to save. Let's press the menu button. We'll do save. We'll do save session and samples as. We're going to call this temp foley. Cool. Don't forget to save. All right, I'm back over at my desk now. I'm gonna deal with this shaker sample first. First thing that we're gonna do is go into the edit screen. We're gonna to go to process and we're gonna to go to normalize and apply. We're gonna go ahead and save this sample in our say main sample directory. And let's just call this uh, silica shaker coop. And now what let's do, excuse me rather, is we're going to start a new, whole new bank here so that we can edit that shaker sample onto various pads and play some patterns. We're going to go ahead and go to our main sample folder. And here is that silica shaker. We'll drag it here. Go to the edit screen. All right. Let's try slice mode, auto slice, let's try split. Let's see if we can maybe get lucky here. That actually looks pretty good. Let's do a right there, 23. We'll do save. Slice the pads. Start at pad one. No choke. Actually, yeah, let's put everything on one choke group so that uh, when you hit one pad, it will shut off any other pads that are playing. That makes sense. We don't need to create a pattern. Let's apply. All right. Now we'll go through and do some finite trims and edits on these and we'll have a whole bank full of cool shaker samples. At this point, it's also a personal preference as to whether you want to normalize this sample or not. I think it sounds pretty good normalized and we, I like a pretty hot signal level. So we're gonna go ahead and normalize these. I've done the fine tuning on the editing of the shaker samples, and we now have 16 shaker samples properly edited out across the pads. If we go into, let's see, song mode, I've created a four bar empty loop, so we can go ahead and hit record and program a little rhythm. I think it's pretty important to get some sort of a kick and snare in this rhythm. So I've picked out a couple of sounds. I just went through everything until I could find something that sounded a bit like a kick drum. This is no processing and something a bit like a snare. Let's go ahead and record something in. Put some swing on that. Yeah, all right, 20% swing sounds about right. Just wanna note that I've gone ahead and put a limiter on the master output. This is the amazing noises limiter. It's just keeping the peaks in line and it's going to give us a little bit of about a one decibel boost over the whole mix. Sounding good. And don't forget to save, save session and samples. I've now put a side chain on the shaker channel and I've side chained that to the kick and snare channel so that every time the kick and snare hit, it ducks just a little bit of the volume off the shaker so the kick and the snare punch through. I've also taken a moment and I've plugged our output into my laptop, which is running Ableton Live. And here I'm just using this for a reference. I've got the FabFilter Pro Q2 loaded up. So now when I press play, I can get a really good frequency spectrum image. And what I'll do is I'll go through 
and I'll do some pretty serious EQ work until I'm happy with everything. Alright, I've done a little bit of adjusting and I'm pretty happy with the way it's sounding. at dub station 2 on send 1 and we've added EOS 2 on send 2 a little bit of reverb everything sounding good It's day two for me, I'm back. I think the first thing we're going to do today is label all of these Foley recordings and file them appropriately so that we can start dividing the banks up a little bit more evenly and accurately. I've labeled the second one here, it was the plastic bag with headphones in it, and I've filed that in our main sample directory. We'll go ahead and just start going through these and I'm gonna rename them and save them in our main sample directory. While I was editing, I found this sample that I really liked that I might end up layering with our snare. Kind of a snappy, clappy kind of a deal. And I wanted to show you a cool little trick when uh, editing samples like this. If you press this button right here, it zooms in a bit on the start of the sample. And if you were to press the other side of that, it would zoom in a bit at the very end of the sample. And this is really helpful when you're doing editing like this. Cool. I ended up trimming out and keeping six sounds from the tiny foam donut recording. I wasn't 100% happy with the arrangement on the live performance there, so I arranged the notes a little bit more to my liking. Got a little flavor there. All right.
really wanted to show this feature that I like about the FabFilter Pro Q2. What we've got here is we've got our actual mix frozen on the screen and it's really really easy to identify these rogue peak frequencies at this point. This is an amazing amazing tool and I just cannot work without it. That's just my personal preference. But so if I play the track into it and I use the freeze mode you can see it's just so easy right there I'll zoom in on that frequency right there that little tiny peak I'll find out what instrument in the mix is making that tiny tiny peak and I will tame it with an EQ oh yeah thanks a lot FabFilter Pro Q you rock my world I've loaded the funky old harmonica sample, and I've trimmed out a pretty nice section of it here, which seems to be pretty even, a pretty long section of it here. And what we're going to do is try to put some loop points into this so that we can hold it down and play it like a melodic sound. I've plugged in my Launch Key Mini to the Novation Audio Hub back here, and I'm using that to control this sound here in Beatmaker 3. <laughs> Now currently, every time I hit a note, it plays the entire length of the sample, and we're going to go into this layer trigger and choose hold instead of one shot, and now, it plays the note only as long as I hold it down, but you see I can only play one note at a time, so we'll go over to uh, the back to the sampler page, and at the polyphony setting, we're going to turn this up, mm, we're going to go to about maybe eight this time. All right, and now we can play eight notes at a time. I often like to assign the attack and the release of my sounds to the macros one and two in Beatmaker 3. And the reason that I do this is you can really customize the sound quite a bit while you're playing in real time. So we have the sound starting off at quite a bit of a punchy, plucky, kind of a synth lead type of a sound. And if I turn the attack of that up, maybe not quite so much, rather, and the release up quite a bit, I can turn t uh, you know, a, a lead sound like that into more of, say, like a dub stab or something. Let's go down an octave. But then just in that same track, a few seconds later, I could be using it as a, a playable lead sound. Just by changing the macros in real time, right on. Well, this is what it's all about. It's time to be creative. I really like the Groovebox app from Novation, so I've loaded it up into my second iPad that I'm normally using to film with. And I've got it running through my second Novation Audio Hub, back here. And all I have to do is turn the volume up, and we are linking and jamming. Let's see if we can get some cool inspiration here. I'm just gonna randomly scroll here. I kinda like this. Yep. I think we might be going with this. I've loaded that preset into Groovebox now. It's called Moth Flame in case you'd like to reference it. We're going to export it into the iPad Mini 2. We'll press Export, Mix, We'll select 16 bars. It's already set to wave, and we definitely would like it to be set to wave. We'll let it render, 
and we'll give it a second. We're going to click the AirDrop tab, and it's going to wait one second and grab it from my iPad Mini 2 here. We're going to choose to open with BeatMaker 3. My AirDrop is being a little fussy tonight. I had to actually exit BeatMaker 3 on the iPad Mini 2, and when I restarted it, I get this message that says new sample is available in the samples directory. That'll be our sample. In the samples directory, yep, here it is. So what I ended up needing to do to compensate tonight was to exit BeatMaker 3 on this side and restart it again. And there was our sample. I wanted to show you guys what the groove box chop looks like. It's got a lot of pretty harsh frequencies in the mids here. And I'm going to use the freeze tool on FabFilter Pro Q. And you'll see that I'll just go in there, I'll tame these just a little bit, and those frequencies won't be quite as harsh on this sound. And in case you're wondering why I'm doing that, take a look at what the mix sounds like when I've played the full track so far. You see how this is just really sticking out of the mids like that? You really don't want that. This section in the middle here should be relatively flat and relatively even. So I'm going to tame those just a little bit. So BeatMaker 3 is being a little bit sluggish here on the iPad Mini 2 now. And I wanted to show you just exactly how much CPU we are in fact pushing on this little guy. What's interesting though is that we're not actually getting crackles in the audio or anything like that. We're just really whooping the CPU. If you've seen some of my other videos, you might know how much I like to assign macros in BeatMaker 3 to stuff. And what I've done is, on the Groovebox Chop channel, I've assigned a bunch of neat stuff to happen when you use Macro 1. Let's check it out. I'm going to give you a solo of what that, what that sounds like, and then I'll show you what I've programmed there. Okay, so currently the sample is just playing back as is. But if I grab Macro 1, it locks it into this glitchy shit. And if I turn Macro 8, I could fade that out of the mix for a while, and then I could say jam on whatever else. When I'm ready for that to come back in the mix, it's still back there glitching out. And I can just turn this knob down and get it back to normal. I've also programmed a melodic part with our funky old harmonica in a way that you might not expect. Check this out. I'm going to use Macro 1 here on the Groovebox channel and I'm going to glitch that up. Yeah, I dig that. And I'm going to fade that out. Okay, now check this out. This is what I made with the harmonica sample. And then we bring it back in by unglitching it by turning macro 1 back down. I don't know about you, but being able to assign so many things to the macros in BeatMaker 3 is just phenomenal to me. Here's what it sounds like if we put that funky old harmonica into keys mode and we put it into a minor pentonic scale. <laughs> So 
sounds pretty cool, and I really don't think that sounds all that much like a harmonica. I've programmed some macros now on the funky old harmonica. Check out how crazy stuff we can do with just four macros programmed only. go from here is really up to you. I think we've done a really good job of getting a groove going from some junk in a drawer. Thanks for watching. Be sure and click that subscribe button for more Beatmaker 3 shenanigans.